This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic topic is... This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic topic is... John Waters, the Pope of Trash, the Sultan of Sleaze, the People's Pervert, the Baron of Bad Taste, and now in his older years known as the Filth Elder. He was born on April 22nd, 1946 to parents John and Patricia Waters. And Nate, how much do you know about uh, John Waters? He exists. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know him. I know, like, you know, he's, you know, quote unquote weirdo. Um, and I hate using that. I hate that word, but you know, it's the, he kind of embraces it. Um, he, uh, you know, drag queens, he's gay, um, hairspray. Um, yeah. I mean, he's yeah, just like, okay. he's kooky, you know, that's, yeah. That's weird kind of, yeah, that's more or less what I knew. Um, basically what I knew about him is he's a director who did underground movies in the seventies. And then I thought he went on to do like family comedies in the eighties and movies. And then during my re- research, I realized I was kind of combining John Waters and John Hughes two people who are both directors named John, but are nothing alike. Right. Not even a close. <laughs> no, no, not even close. Turns out he did not direct a bunch of John candy movies. So, um, or, or breakfast club or breakfast club. Yeah. I thought that was a John Waters movie breakfast club or 16 oh, wow. candles. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's that how far been... off base I was. Yeah. Those would have been way different. Yeah. Well, that's why I was like, wow, he started as a sleazy guy and then went to family movies. That's kind of neat. He's got range. <laughs> Could you imagine John Waters breakfast club? Oh man. That'd be, Ooh, I would kind of like to see that. That. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I would do. That'd be funny. And it's also kind of made me realize that between John Hughes, John Waters, John Landis, and John Carpenter, there are too many directors named John in the 80s. We need to eliminate two. P.S. I am not a crackpot. <laughs> well, John, favorites. like, this seems to be a very generic name. You know, yeah. it's one of those things like, okay, quick, generic name for, for this generic character, John. Or John, Pete, yeah. Or... John Doe. <laughs> yeah, John or Joe. Yeah, legitimately John Doe. <laughs> yep. So uh, research for this episode involved watching a lot of interviews with him and doing a lot of reading. So uh, he's good at telling stories. And randomly in the middle of all this talking, we're just going to pop in and just tell a quick little story that John Waters liked to share that I found amusing and or funny. And also one thing I noticed too doing this research, John over the years has talked a lot about people he would have loved to have been over the years. He was like, during interviews, he's just like, I would have loved to have been this person or grown up. I always wanted to be this person. So I kind of made like a small list of just a fraction of the people he brought up. Growing up and later in life, even, he wanted to grow up to become a beatnik, a greaser, Little Richard. He even said about Little Richard, he wanted to literally crawl up inside of his skin and wear him like a flesh suit and become Little Richard because it would freak out his parents and his grandma. Little Richard, also the person who inspired his pencil thin mustache. I was about to say, like, you know, when I thought Little Richard, I thought of the pencil thin mustache. Yep, that's like, exactly um, what he did because he was like, hey, that is over the top and weird and I don't like it. He also go. wanted to be Captain Hook. He wanted to be Johnny Mathis, who he says is the exact opposite of him, and that's why he wants to be Johnny Mathis. He also wanted to be the Wicked Witch of the West, Clarabelle from the, the Clown from the Howdy Doody Show, and he also wants to be Don Knotts, and he's willing to fight Steve Buscemi for the role of Don Knotts in a movie. And my brain has a hard time putting together John Waters and Steve Buscemi fighting in a steel cage. My brain's just, like, refusing to, like, be able to process that. I would like to see it, but... Yeah. He might be too old now if they did Don Knotts. I don't know. Don Knotts got pretty old, but... Yeah, we have makeup. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Whatever happened uh, to Don Knotts? He's dead. I mean, I, well, yeah, no, he died. <laughs> nah. I mean, I mean it's like they have what happened to everybody, but that was just one minute he was everywhere, and then he was like... Yeah, he was like a big staple of our childhood, and then, I don't know, like mid-80s, he just sort of disappeared. I mean, he yeah. turned to a cartoon fish at one point. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much the last I remember of him. Was well, that, of course, fish. always Andy Griffith, you know. It's... Yeah, and he was in a few movies. According to his daughter, too, apparently he was uh, quite the ladies' man, quite the poon hound. <laughs> Oh, I can see that. Yeah, actually, I can. I mean, too. With, with, I mean, no, no offense, no offense at all. But like, with a face like his, and all of a sudden you get super famous, and all of a sudden you look like you don't have to really try anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can totally. He's see got that. time to make up. Because <laughs> let, I mean, if you go from like striking out right and left, and then all of a sudden you're hitting nothing but homers, you, you probably. Like, I'm going to keep this lucky play. train rolling. Yeah, until it until it stops happening. So, uh, oh yeah, also. Uh, John Waters says he gets confused by flight attendants all the time for being Steve Buscemi. Oh, like, really? Hello, Mr. Buscemi. He's like, uh, sure. I don't think they look that close. I mean, uh, neither do I, actually. I mean, they're just small and scrawny kind of guys. Skinny. I guess. With I mean, kind of like little mustaches. Occasionally, uh, occasionally I've seen Buscemi kind of have a pencil thin mustache, but that's not very often. No, but Buscemi, the thing that stands out to him is his eyes and his teeth. And I just, when I, when I think 
John Waters. I don't think eyes that like. Yeah, I know he has them, but I don't like. I'm not. Those don't stand out, you know. So what we can assume is flight attendants might not be that smart sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> Do not uh rely on them for eyewitness testimony. Yeah. Not disparage, you know. Flight attendants, yeah, because I, I mean that's a hell of a job. I want to do it. You're up there like every day shooting up through a cannon through the star, uh, not stars, <laughs> huh. through, the, through the sky, and you know dealing with people, um, you know of all types, and you know, and yeah. you know who deals with people of all types. John Waters. Back to him. He grew up in the town of or the suburbs of Baltimore called Lutherville, and he loves the city of Baltimore. It's his home, and. He understands why other people love Baltimore, but he cannot understand why anyone would ever move there willingly. He says it's a place where everyone thinks they're normal, but they are extremely weird. He likes to tell stories about Baltimore, too, and here's a couple of them that I actually found kind of amusing. One of them he said that actually sums up Baltimore and its redneckedness really well. He said he was walking down an alley after a rainstorm one day when he came across a little redneck girl in a tattered red dress playing in a mud puddle. As he walked by the girl, she looked up at him with a joyous, with a joyous look on her face and proclaimed to him, I just drowned me a worm. John looked down at her and was just like, oh, you sweet, sweet young thing. Your story is just beginning, you little psycho. Uh, well, she, yes and no. You can't drown worms. Well, yes. I Okay, cool. Um, you were a lot of fun at parties. <laughs> Another story, this story he told about at Baltimore just kind of made me laugh because this seems like something that happened to one of the weird bars around here. He's just minding his own business, having a drink when some dude just wandered up to him and unprovoked stated, you know, people think I'm a 30-year-old drug addict, but I'm really just a 40-year-old alcoholic. Hmm. And John was just like, that's the weirdest thing to say to a stranger. Like, who are you? Yeah, who are you and why are you saying that? I guess the conversation just kind of ended there. But his upbringing in Baltimore was actually pretty good. He was raised in a uh, pretty strict Roman Catholic household. Uh, his parents constantly telling him all the uh, ways to be good and prim and proper in society. And he said this was probably the best thing for his career and for him developing because his parents had taught him how to uh, properly behave in society. And because he learned those rules, he knew exactly how to freak people out and how to break those rules. He uh, nice. went on to say that, yeah, you need to know the rules of taste before you can break them with wit, he said. And he's 100% correct on that. You get brought up prim and proper, you're like, I know how to freak these peoples out. And although his parents were pretty strict as far as like... Uh, manners and rules and bring him up in society kind of thing they were actually very supportive of his weirdness and his movies they didn't like his movies but they were supportive of him well also i mean let's be real you know with i mean i would think the same too it was like oh i don't support you but how much money you're making okay well i guess i'll yeah um, i guess i'll uh, <laughs> forego my uh well uh in all honesty he did not make a lot of money until like hairspray came up to be honest he was kind of eh. He said his early movies, all the way up to like through Pink Flamingos, he didn't become rich. He was being a hundred air by that point. Yeah, well, we'll actually get into uh, how broke he was kind of at times, because it turns out they had to actually steal a lot of their stuff to uh, shoot some of the early movies. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and I will say that I'm I'm making that, I made that claim thinking about later John Waters, not, you know, earlier John Waters. Yeah, yeah. Early on, it was uh, pretty rough for him. As most kids did back then, uh, when he was a wee little one, he loved himself some Howdy Doody. Talk to anybody from that generation, everybody watched Howdy Doody, because it was like one of two shows you had an option of watching back then. Right, that yep. terrifying puppet. Yeah, oh, yep. Uh, actually, Clarabelle and Flubadub the puppet, or Flubadub the puppet was one of his favorite characters, as was Clarabelle the clown, and it said those two were big fashion inspirations for him, because they just wore big, bright, colorful clothes and, you know, big eye-catching ensembles. And, oh, fun side fact, the original Clarabelle the clown went on to become uh, the original Captain Kangaroo after a labor dispute. Oh, there you go. Yep. John Waters loved uh, Howdy Doody so much that his parents would actually drive him from Baltimore to New York to see the Howdy Doody live as part of the studio audience. And he remembers the first time going there and he was all excited to see puppets wandering around and, you know, all the magic and strange, funny things that would be happening. And he walked in there and his mind was blown when he realized it was nothing but cameras and cranky old teamsters walking around chain smoking and yelling at people. <laughs> and he looked around, he's like, oh my God, this show is all a lie. And this is glorious, a glorious, glorious lie. I must be part of this process to lie to people and create uh, imagination. And yep, that how do you, having the veil of howdy doody lifted is what got him going and interested in Hollywood. He also remembers from the recordings too, Buffalo Bob being really mean and yelling at the kids and telling them to shut up or they wouldn't get their Milky Way bar. They bribed the kids with candy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Apparently, apparently the kids were not treated that great. It sounded like on the uh, set. Be like, hey. If you don't do exactly what we're talking about, we will not give you your candy and we will kick you out and scream at you for a while. Probably even paddle your butt. 
Well, back then, I mean, they'd be like a dead child on the street. That's kind of kicking to the side. Like, yeah, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Let's be real. Like, the children were exactly like, you know, this kid, Was this kid an orphan we got, or did he have parents? He was an orphan. All right, we're fine. Just leave him there. I mean, is this age where, like, I mean, maybe I'm conflating, but, like, the um, at the World's Fair, they gave away a baby because I got a, with a raffle and no one knows what happened to it? I mean. <laughs> I never heard that story. <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. That actually happened, and it was I believe only, that it was only within the last thirty years you weren't allowed to like ship children through the mail. I actually, so, yeah, I did hear that, that it was kind of common to ship kids through the mail sometimes, even I babies. Out, I, out, I forget. This is not the nineties. Probably the last fifty years. <laughs> let's, you know, let's, <laughs> let's say you know, it's twenty twenty three. It's not you know. Like, actually, you know, I was so. thinking when you said like thirty years, I was like, oh, it sounds wrong, but I'll just go with yeah, it. No, I, it is wrong. Also, to my it's brain, totally when wrong. you said thirty years, my brain popped back kind of like the fifties or the forties because we're talking That's, about yeah. like the seventies right yep. now. I mean, there's like that—that's a show on Netflix where we're talking about. Um, oh man, what is it? It's the Japanese show about little kids going off on their own, like old oh, yeah. enough. That's what it is. And actually, it's 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 kind of interesting. Yeah, Japanese I show. Mean, Hope my kid comes back. I think is yeah, pretty called. well. It, they're, they're they're being followed by a camera crew, but uh, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> fucking three year old, three to five year old kids going off like a mile away to the store and pick up stuff. I'm just like, good lord! And they're like, this show's been going on thirty years. I'm like, that's crap. And then there's all sort of like, wait a minute. Huh, maybe there's a reason for this. That's that's the nineties. Uh yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. All you think of too is the kid does get kidnapped. You're like, the camera crew is there. What were they doing? Hey, we caught the whole thing on camera. They pulled up in a van, grabbed the kid, and took off. It was awesome. John Waters continued attending as many howdy doody showings as he could just because he loved puppeteering and puppets. Also, the nineteen fifty three movie Lily gave him an even bigger love of puppets. In fact, by the age of twelve, he was doing puppet shows at birthday parties in the neighborhood, uh, for other kids. And basically he started out with a. Uh, Kind of a little punch and Judy routine, you know, to them arguing back and forth, hitting themselves with sticks. And as uh, he got more and more gigs and people more and more showed up for his uh, shows, he started getting them more and more violent, too, and started to push the envelope. And this started getting parents slightly concerned. And eventually, when he started putting in fake blood into his little plays, and I mean, like, <laughs> a lot of fake blood, like spraying fake blood everywhere. Yeah, the neighborhood kind of put a kibosh on his uh, puppet stories. Because oh, I guess it was like a point where he was like spraying kids with fake blood kind of stuff and he could get away with it. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I, I can yeah, see that. Yeah, because he was just like, hmm, I was able to spray this much blood and get away with it. What if I double the amount of blood? And yeah, he only got away with it for so long, but good time. And also, he's down enough information, but he was getting paid for this too, actually. Earning a little bit of money on the side. As like Gallagher with blood. Yeah, yeah, ha, exactly. Oh, that'd be awesome. Pull out, just set the puppet down the ground, pull out a big old hammer, just smash it, blood everywhere. Man, I used to be like really fun at Gallagher, but all of a sudden out of nowhere, it's just he's just disappeared and then come to find out like, you know, he had a twin brother who was doing acts, pretend to be him. Yeah, he like that. licensed out his name to a couple people and yeah, it's weird. And then he like kind of went full Trump derangement syndrome at one point, I think. Yeah, I think I remember you telling me about that. Yeah, or something weird. And, and then you go back and watch his comedy and you're like, oh, this wasn't that funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. But like you, I kind of liked him back like when I first saw him in, I don't know, 88 or 90 or whatever it was way back when. Well, it was one of those things like, you know, um, when you're starving and also someone gives you a cracker, like, oh, my God, this is the best yeah, cracker Yeah, this ever. is true. Yeah. Yeah. But then when you have like actually, you know, you eat a lot, also gives someone your cracker, you're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Also, yeah. when you got like Netflix and you look up all sorts of comedians or YouTube, yeah. you're like, oh, wait a minute. Hmm, that's trash. Another story about John being a weird, awkward child is... One of his favorite pastimes to do was his have his mom drive him to the auto, local auto wrecking yard, where he'd re- gleefully track down cars that had been in accidents and try to come up with how and why of these cars got into wrecks, if anybody died, and all the possible trauma that happened all around. Sometimes even uh, he would take a hammer and smash up the car a little more to suit his story, break out all the windows and stuff, and be like, and this is where she flew out the window. Ha ha ha. Smash, smash, smash. <laughs> yeah honestly that sounds like something i would have done if i'd got, been able to get away with it yeah 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 yeah, yeah everybody like, and the car rain. caught on fire and they screamed and ran out of it and your parents are just like uh huh yeah free rain in a like a trash yard with this cars and you can smash yep. it what you want you i guarantee i do that now <laughs> yeah honest guy i probably wouldn't do it now they will yell at you wrecking yards if you do it but yeah it would be kind of punchy back like, ah, i'm gonna go street fire two on this car yeah uh his parents were a little bit concerned because he remembers uh them asking his pediatrician if it was normal and the pediatrician just responded eh, if he wants to smash up a car just let him that's the response john waters remembers honestly if you kind of like flip the way that's phrased it almost sounds like a pediatrician who's just exasperated with too many questions and he's just like 
If he wants to smash up a car, just let him. Stop asking me questions. Your kid's weird. Go away. Right? Just, I mean, what yeah. a hell of a response. If your kid wants to smash up cars, just let him. Yeah, <laughs> right? And John Waters was phrasing like the pediatrician. was just like, it's okay. But I picture more like the pediatrician just being like, I don't know. Your kid's messed up. Go away. <laughs> Stop asking me questions. And uh, this actually, so the parents just kept letting him do this. And it just kind of stoked the fires of weirdness. Yeah, and, weirdness. Uh, yeah. And as a bad guy also, too, kind of like you and me, he was a fan of the bad guys in cartoons and movies he did not like the good guys he said the bad guys seemed like they had so much more fun and also had better fashion sense uh, i agree with him on that both of yeah, them bad guys always seem to have more they fun did. good guys are always just so uptight and uh, uh, his holy trinity of characters from his youth Rhonda pinmark the psychotic child who murdered people in the 1956 movie the bad seed which i actually vaguely remember that movie captain hook uh, he loved Captain Hook so much, he actually uh, jammed a coat hanger up his arm uh, sleeve one uh, year. And for the better part of a year, just like would walk around with the coat hanger poking out, pretend to be Captain Hook. His parents, also not impressed, but supportive of that as well. And finally, the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz, who he, think is probably one of the, he thinks is one of the best villains of all time and loves her fashion sense. And uh, in fact, at the age of 10, he dressed like her for a party, and he says that's the only time he's ever dressed in drag. He likes drag queens, but apparently that's the only time he dressed as in drag. It's, I don't know, when you're 10, does that really count as a drag queen? I don't think so. Or is that so. just kid dressing as a witch? Yeah. That's know. kid dressing up. I yeah, mean, yeah, that'd be my thought. And he said he didn't even want, it wasn't even dressed like a girl. He just wanted green skin and to wear uh, a nice outfit. Well, let me amend that. If if a you know a child is dressing up like, I want to be dressing like a woman with the intent of like, this is me in a dress as a woman, then drag, sure. Yeah, yeah. So but if true. it's... If it's me dressing up as a character I like that happens to be a woman, eh. Yeah, and I think the key word here is for a party. So it's not like he was just like, I'm going to go to the store dressed like this because this is my new look. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, he, he also said, uh, thinks The Wizard of Oz is one of the greatest movies ever made with one of the worst mo- endings ever. He calls it a very depressing ending where poor Dorothy goes back to, uh, to her crappy home in Kansas instead of living in the wonderful land of Oz where she could have a pet monkey and a gay lion friend. Right, I'm, I'm I mean, with him on that too. I was I, up, even the first time I saw that. I'm like, why are you going back to that shithole where you're going to live in poverty on a dying farm and probably get polio? You go back to Oz where you live like a hero, have pet monkeys, and probably die of polio. They might have polio there still. I mean, I, why would you go back there? They yeah. they didn't. I mean, I'm not going to say they were abusive to her, but they were very dismissive. Yeah, like oh, everybody whatever. at Oz treated her better. Even the Wicked Witch, I think, treated her better than her parents did. It felt like. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. I mean, because at least yeah. the Wicked Witch treated her like you know she had. She might not have been on our side, but she definitely was, you know, treated her like a person. Yeah, and at the beginning, she kind of did give her a chance to, like, join her side and give her the shoes and stuff, sort of-ish. I mean, she could have been a horrible villain in that world if she wanted to. Another massive influence for John Waters was, remember those old schlocky horror movies from the 40s and 50s where they'd hire all those actors to do weird stunts and stuff? You know, the director would show up in a casket in the back of a hearse and pop out and be like, It's me! Or, Mario. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a me, Mario. And you're like, who are you? Who's Mario? And they're like, you'll know in a 30 years, kids. Uh, but real real quick segue. Um, you know the the phrase, it's a me, Mario? Yeah. Uh, apparently, that's actually, um, that's our dumb, like, uh, not human, our dumb, like, English-speaking brains, you know, because we think Italians, it's like, it's a me, Mario, you know, because he's a, it's a me. Actually, it's Itsumi, which is I am. In Japan, Japanese, so he's saying oh. I'm Mario. Oh. It's like, yeah, right? Huh. I did not know that. That totally makes sense, though. Yeah, it totally does. But it's it works like, Mario. oh, it's a me. Oh yeah, okay. Hmm. Now I know <laughs> that. I, I like that fun fact. More learning today. That being said, if anybody's listening to this and they're like, that doesn't mean that, then feel free to write in. I saw on TikTok, yeah. I could be completely wrong. Off top topic at gmail dot com. Right? Because yes, yeah, sometimes we are wrong, and we uh, actively want to be corrected. And if you, if you engage with podcast, us, if you listen to this podcast, you've noticed multiple times. I'm like, I could look something up, but I won't. <laughs> yep, we'll just run with this plan. So, uh, you know, there was this one movie that uh, was making the rounds back then. That it was uh, when you showed up, you had to sign a release because you might die of fear in the theater. Remember those stories about that thing? Yes, I remember those. So, when John Waters was young and naive, he saw that coming to town. He got super excited because his thought was, "Hey." If they're making people sign releases, obviously people are dying during these things. Maybe not every showing, but people are dying. So he went to every uh, showing and would just sit there and just stare at everybody in the audience, like make bets with himself on who's going to die this time. And would be uh, very disappointed when people would not die. That Yeah, that's, I mean, great marketing, but also yeah, stupid. Yeah, but yeah, also kind of stupid. 
But 76 did have actually pretty clever stuff. Like he remembers one where uh, during a certain scene, a skeleton on guide wires would come like swooping out from above the screen and shoot back to the projector room. Apparently that would actually sc- uh, scare some people because, you know, not really expecting it. Well, yeah, fair enough. I mean, that's yeah. not coming from the screen. That's like a jump scare from inside the theater. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, yeah, that's what haunted houses were. Yep. Yep. I mean, and then the Tingler came to town, and that was the one where they installed literally a buzzers and shockers in the seats. Uh, John realized early on that because his theater in his local town was really podunk and small, they only installed buzzers in like every seventh or eighth seat. So uh, he would just get there ahead of time and go crawling around on the floor trying to find which one had a buzzer so he knew he'd get the full experience. <laughs> like, uh, I must and, know. Yeah. And uh, he said that he loved the shock uh moments from these movies and people you know just screaming and freaking out and be like oh god and, you know people would apparently like get so uh scared at times they would puke during the uh showings and he said that he really really from that point on wanted nothing more than to shock people and scare people so much that they would get sick and he said uh he kind of uh, accomplished that coming up with pink flamingos we'll talk about that scene shortly well i mean yeah. the thing is like i don't know I, this the people back then also had a lower tolerance I, I believe that too. It's like, oh my god, that scared me to death. I'm like, mm. yeah, 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 right. It's like, eh, eh, mm, but yeah, it I'm, yeah. Like, and also, or, it's probably a small percentage of people that got that freaked out. I'm sure there's plenty of people that are just like, yeah, yeah, or the, the whole thing, like, uh, what was it? The like, oh, the spider from the Ewok movie. Oh my god, it's so realistic. Uh, yeah, it's terrifying. Ah. Um, actually, apparently, in uh, the original King Kong. And during the test screenings, there was a scene where they had uh, people fall off like a bridge, a rope bridge. And down below, there's a bunch of uh, stop motion giant spiders that ate them. And I guess that scene was so horrifying that people only talked about that after the movie. So they actually had to cut it from King Kong because they realized it was overshadowing the main character. Lame. Yeah, I yeah, know. I really want to see that scene. Who knows if it actually exists anymore? Oh, I'm sure it's somewhere. I mean, I, you know what? I, I say that, but from back in the day, there's been so many... Um, also, film Fires back then was or, day two, yeah. So they reused film if they could at times. As yeah, well. yeah. They, I mean, that was thinking either a fire or just they just, uh, just someone just or just disintegrated in. from time, right? I mean, it's not exactly like they were preserving these things with the best quality stuff. So one of John's early formative things in his youth was when he was at Catholic school. The nuns pulled him aside, and they knew he was into movies. And they told him that there was one movie he should never, ever even think about seeing. Because if he saw it, it's a one-way trip to hell, Nate. Instantly, boom, you go in that theater, you're going to hell, son. Exodus. Uh, nope, this is ah. in the 50s. Okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, so, you know, what happens when you tell somebody like John Waters, you know, you're going to hell if you see this movie? Of course, he runs out to see this movie. Uh, this movie actually was, in fact, banned in many places and was very, very controversial. And uh, the reason it's so controversial is because back then it was one of the only, if not maybe the only movie touring around that you go see that actually had a full frontal nudity, which was a huge no-no back in the day. It had full shots of genitalia and everything. How'd they get around the uh, standards of this time? They showed medical footage of live births and various STDs to get away, get around the full frontal nudity thing, and thus they were educational films. <laughs> the thing was start, to... Huh? movie starts off, they're like, look at this, a baby being born. Look at this cadaver. Now, now we got that out of the way. <laughs> sex. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Actually, the sex was the birth. That was, There wasn't any actual sex in it, I don't believe. It was just like people would sit around in the theater just watch a lady give birth just so they could see a hoo Wow. Yeah, and it's the thing was... Star you would, people. Yep. But the thing was, this film was popular enough that it ran through the 40s and 50s, and it made $40 million in back then money. Yeah, $40 million. Wow. And this was just kind of an underground thing. And Waters noticed when he went to see this that he thought the movie was kind of gross, naturally, because, you know, it's like, hey, here's a penis with chlamydia kind of stuff. But John Waters looked around and he noticed it was all men, and it was all men who kind of like zoned out, except for when the nudity scenes would show up, and then they would just promptly get all horny and start beating off. And he's like, yes, dudes were sitting there watching a woman give birth, like in an educational film, and whacking it. Times were different back then. That, yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. And this kind of influenced him on the fact that he was like, hey man, people will get excited and watch almost anything if it's like ver- uh, forbidden, you know? Yeah. If it's something the censors don't want you to see, people will go out of their way to go watch it. So that kind of influenced him. Then, in his teenage years, his grandma gave him an 8 millimeter video camera and said, Hey, you like movies? Go nuts, kid. Make yourself some movies. And he did. So he started making friends in high school and some high school adjacent friends. And they started making movies together. 
Ah, uh, the high school adjacent friends. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> who, who will forget the first high school adjacent friend? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the ones that buy them beer, I'm guessing, is probably what this was, or supplied them with weed. Uh, he actually, what it was is he knew some people from high school, and also there were some from like college film schools that uh, kind of like overlapped. So, yeah. Gotcha. He, yeah. So, everybody was kind of around the right same age here, except for a few outliers. But this original cast and crew would go on to be known as the Dreamlanders after the name of their production co company, Dreamland Productions. Uh, fun fact, too. Everybody's going to call them Dreamlanders. John Waters and crew, everybody calls them Dreamlanders. Uh, mm -hmm. They never called themselves that. That was something the press made up for them. Everybody thinks oh, yeah. that they called themselves Dreamlanders. Yeah, they're like, we never called ourselves Dreamlanders. Uh, the press made that up. We just called ourselves friends. Uh, but they were like, their impression was like, they weren't that big on it, but they're like, eh, they could call us a lot worse things. So we'll just let that one stick. Yeah. Too. I mean, yeah. Not... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they weren't offended by it, but everybody's like, wow, you call yourself a dreamland. It's like, well, no, but whatever. <laughs> like, okay. How about these derogatory terms? Okay. Yeah, we'll go exactly. They could, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of worse things they could have called them back yeah. then. Among these friends was Harris Glenn Milstead. Who would be go go on to be known as a famous drag queen divine, who John Wa John Waters famously calls the most beautiful woman in the world. Almost, John Waters also said about divine beauty is looks you can't forget, and that's divine. I've seen car accidents happen over divine's looks. Uh, of course, well, talking about divine yeah. being a full drag. Yeah, there's actually yeah. a scene of Pink Flamingos where they're like in a car following her down the street, walking around a full drag with a camera, and man, people are just stopping and staring, like, what the hell is that? Because uh, think about Divine. You know what Divine looks like, right? Yes. Okay. And Ursula was based off of Divine. Like, it's basically a one for one. They look almost mm -hmm. identical. Uh, basically, Divine was the very first drag queen that looked that way. Before that, all drag queens, there was definitely drag queens around, but they wanted to look like their moms, all prim, proper housewives, nice permed hair, wearing pretty dresses and heels, and you know, do, 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 do. Divine was just like, screw that. I'm just going full over the top. I'm going to shave my head and put on a big old poofy wig and giant makeup and eyebrows. And I just want to scare people. In fact, uh, John Waters says that mostly uh, the Divine character was invented to scare hippies. Because I guess hippies weren't as quite as tolerant as you would think about drag queens back then. John Waters does not like hippies. He kind of talks down about them a lot. He says they're too militant and kind of set in their ways. Yeah, like, I can see that. Yeah, him and Divine yeah. actually lived down the road from a hippie commune at one point, and they were so militant anti meat eaters. Like, I mean, go out of their way to make you miserable if they thought you ate meat. That if they had extra money, they would go to the meat market, buy a buttload of meat, and just leave it on their doorstep just to piss them off. So they'd have to clean it up and touch it. <laughs> yeah, he considered himself and his friends yippies, which is a term I never really heard before. But he calls it an anti hippie, someone who uses snark and humor to change the system instead of love and music. I'd say Stark and Humor probably does work better than Love and Music. Yeah, but I mean, let's be real. It's it's not Love and Music. You know, it's yeah. if you're if you're being that shitty to people, that then Love is just like love for your own kind or people yeah. who think like you. you know, that's intolerance not, wrapped in a mask of love. Right. I mean, yeah. that, that's the thing. Like, it's it's the intolerance part that's yeah. the, the reason why he hates hippies. Yeah, it's, exactly. Because there were a lot of hippies. that was like, hey, if you're not exactly like us in any way, you're a conformist man. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're against people like I don't know. Like, I don't want to get too political on here, but you know, if you're against people who are support policies that end up with people dying or being miserable, then you, okay, I, you know, I, cause I definitely have my biases toward certain people who believe certain things, but like, come on, man, if you're being a hippie, you're, you're hating on people who are also like not part of the mainstream, you know, mm -hmm. like these people are all, are they're, they're being, you know, you're being shitty, like you're, you're being shed on by society and there's another group that's also being shed on by society you know yeah. punch up also, not across yeah thank you or down yes. or whatever just yeah. like you know that's that's the issue i have yeah i'm with you on that it's like hey you guys are all on the same side maybe you should not fight each other and uh face forward and find a common goal uh another fun story that also uh influenced john a lot in uh, his movie making he told a story about where him and Divine would skip school and head downtown to see one of the old, uh, last old school burlesque vaudeville style shows you could see around Baltimore. You know, one of those where they just had all sorts of stripping and high wire acts and drinking and weird stuff. Uh, and apparently they, since it was kind of a dying industry, they had no qualms about letting in any ages, no matter what. They were just like, oh, kid, you want to come in? Your money's good. Fine. Go sit down. And he remembers one act that he said was one of the greatest acts he ever seen and he loved it. It was about a lady whose stage name was Zorro, and he said she basically looked like Johnny Cash. 
And she would come out on the stage just completely nude. No striptease, no nothing. So you got a nude female Johnny Cash up there. And her whole stick, she would just start pointing at dudes in the crowd and be like, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? You like this? You want some of this? What are you looking at? That was her whole shtick, and people loved it. She got standing ovations, people throwing money on the stage, people cheering. Uh, yeah, sounds that weird. Sounds but... like a... <laughs> I mean, there has to be more than that. It has to be more than that, because that's that. <laughs> that's so boring. This is, well, <laughs> it depends, because, I mean, you got to picture her not being very attractive, too, and being all gruff and just, like, waving her tits angrily at people. I can picture her being kind of amusing. Also, keep in mind, this is probably the same crew that was also just recently watching a VD film and jerking off, so... I guess. Yeah, these might not be the <laughs> biggest standards of uh, quality type people. All right, we're going to fast forward to 1964 when John Waters decides to finally make his first ever movie, which was a short film called Hag in a Black Leather Jacket. Catchy title, huh? The plot? A KKK <laughs> member marries a black woman and a white woman atop the roof of his parents' house. Uh, that is John Waters' parents' house. Uh, yeah, KKK member marrying an interracial couple. Yay! Yay! And uh, he even managed to talk his mom to let them use her uh, wedding dress for the video, and they shot it on top of his parents' house. The movie was made on a budget of $30, and they were only able to make it for that cheap because they literally just stole the film to make it. And everything else was just invested in props and probably developing the film. Way after they got it uh, made up, John managed to get it shown in a beatnik ho- coffee house once, and no one paid attention. Not one person even watched the video. It just, like, played on the wall, and that was it. That's painful. Yeah, yeah it kind of is. Uh, he also says, uh, with this movie, too, he kind of wishes he realized that editing was a thing, because he was young enough at that time, he just kind of assumed that whatever you shot is what you put on a movie. He said that whatever went on film just went straight on the screen. And he actually, he said it was Dogma 1995, but ahead of its time in that regard. Uh, unsure what that means. It sounds like a Kevin Smith reference. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that is Dogma 95, not a lot of editing going on. I don't know. I mean, I, I thought so. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Listen, to, listen to Kevin Smith, you know, recently, uh, recently being, you know, last several years or decade or whatever. You know, he's, he, lo- he calls himself an editor. He's like, he loves editing. So he, every time he talks about a movie, when he reviews something, he's like, oh, I would have I cut this, I would have cut that. So, I mean. So it sounds like he's overcompensating for not editing enough in his youth. Gotcha. May, maybe. I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so many people yelled at me for not editing my early movies right. I, mean, I like I like Kevin Smith, but I'm not like, you know, yeah. well-versed. Yeah, I just ask you because I know you know more about Kevin Smith than me. Yeah, yeah fair. Yeah, I mean, I've seen Dogma and Jane Silent Bob Strikes Back and maybe like one other of his movies. I like him. It's just, I don't know. I've just never gotten around to watching him. Yeah, I've seen a decent chunk of them. I think I didn't see like uh, Yoga Hosers and I didn't see um, oh, yeah, like, or like more Tusk recently. or some of them. Or... Tusk. And I mean, I've heard, I don't know, like I was actually listening to, it's funny because I was listening to his podcast while he was making those and while he was releasing those. So I heard like, um, kind of like, the making of, if you will, while he was doing it. And I also even heard the original because Tusk was based off of a conversation he had on a podcast with his friend. Um, what's his face? It doesn't matter. Um, and they were talking like they were like, go just kind of riffing like we do. And they went off on this whole tangent about like some guy who captures someone turns into a walrus. You know, it was all based on some news article they saw. And that spun off into that movie. And they, yeah, they made the whole movie based on apparently at the end credits of the, of Tusk, they play, clips of that conversation that hmm. led to the movie which you know it's all fine and dandy but i've also heard the movie's terrible uh, so. i yeah the best thing i've heard about that movie is it was interesting i think it was the best comment i heard about it yeah i mean and he got hell he got johnny Depp to do it and because apparently johnny Depp's daughter is best friends with his daughter so yeah. and uh yeah they, they were like they were together he just kind of said hey i'm not you know this is gross and if you don't you know if this is makes you uncomfortable feel free to just like ignore me but he's like i have this role and he gave him the script, and apparently Johnny Depp called him up. And was like, "Are you fucking serious? Huh. Like, are you really gonna do this? Like, this, you know, this is ridiculous. Are you really gonna make this movie?" He's, he's like, like yeah. he's "I'm like, in. I, I'm in." This is exactly yeah. what it was. Like, I, <laughs> that I'm sounds in. like Johnny Depp. You yeah. know, it was also a good friend of Johnny Depp, John Waters. Actually, we'll get nice. to that in a few. Yeah, actually, they got to get, they became good friends during the shooting Crybaby. I mean, that like, makes sense it. because yeah, yeah, he was in Crybaby and let's, uh, Johnny Depp's. I mean, it's not definitely not a one to one, but Johnny Depp is good buddies with. Uh, Tim Burton, who's yeah, also yeah, there, and that's like, kind of that whole little weirdo crew kind of yeah, thing. I mean yeah. weirdo in the most loving way possible, of course, totally. So the uh, six, uh, the lack of success of Hag in a black leather jacket did not dissuade John from making more short films. Next up was the movie Roman Candles. At that time, uh, everybody was looking up to Andy Warhol because he was the king of the underground movies at the time, and he was making an experimental movie called Chelsea Girls that involved showing two movie reels side by side to tell its story. 
Naturally, John Waters wanted to be a one-upper, and he said, we're going to do that, but with three film reels. The film more or less was just a bunch of short, unrelated skits and movies, basically just him and his friends screwing around, nothing too interesting. Some of them was actually footage of John and Divine legit shoplifting themes from a department store. Oh, wow. turns out, <laughs> Yeah, it turns out one way Dreamlander supported their movies was by shoplifting what they needed and uh, selling uh, what they stole or using the stolen stuff in the movies. And uh, much of the early John Waters movies had actual like real soundtracks with real produced music. Yeah, he didn't have the rights to those. It was all records he stole over the years. <laughs> Am I to assume that, um, like, <laughs> like they didn't use that as evidence against him? Like, to have, what proof do you have we stole this? Well, let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, as far as I know, outside of, like, a few art houses, that movie never really got shown. He'll show it at some of his film festivals, but, yeah, it's, yeah, not many people have actually really seen it, I don't believe. And, uh, oh, yeah, also as far as getting a sound records and for the soundtracks, John Waters actually had a special record-stealing coat he would wear. It had pockets that were big enough to fit a whole LP inside of them. Mm-hmm. You just slide a whole record in there, and he got really good at it. But there was this one time, as he was stealing a record, he noticed the security guard. She looked over and saw him sliding the record into his pocket. And he, like, panicked and, you know, a second later put the record back. But she did not see him put the record back. So as he was leaving the department store, he got tackled and arrested. And they couldn't find a record on him. So he was like, hey, this is false imprisonment or false arrestment. And he got a $3,000 settlement out of this that he went on to use to make more movies with. Nice. In fact, that year that he got busted, he was a teenager and his parents were like, well, John, it's the summer. Are you going to get a summer job so you have money to make your movies? And he's like, ha, I want a lawsuit. I got three grand. I don't need to do nothing. Parents, not really impressed with that, but still supportive. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, Our boy's going to go get a job this summer. Oh, he want a lawsuit for what? <laughs> you mean, something he was completely guilty of, but realized he was getting caught. So he like was yep. smart <laughs> enough to get rid of the evidence. Yeah, exactly. That was good luck on his part. So yeah, and I, I great, love mm-hmm. you. Th- you know, think later on in life, like when he starts telling the story, the you know, eventually the security guard hears it. It's like I fucking knew it. Yeah, right. I knew that son of a bitch cost me my job. Yeah, she probably did cost me. They uh, he sued and won. I yeah, he she didn't keep that job. Yeah, probably not. Uh, so. All those records he stole, yeah, they started using them in all their early movies, even up through uh, Pink Flamingos. They were using those stolen records. And in case you're wondering how he got away without using those with having the license for him, eh, he really didn't. He did for a lot of years until the 90s when he started getting like more popular and all of a sudden the MPA or uh, the uh, music industry was like, hey, 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 we know you don't have uh, licenses for a lot of these songs. It cost him be- somewhere between, from what he was saying, 25 to 30 grand per song that he used in those movies. So it was kind yeah, of expensive. It, yeah, I mean that's that's the key word. It's like until you get noticed, like you, yep. you yeah, yeah, they will find you get, eventually. Yeah, you do all this stuff to get noticed, then finally you're noticed. That's when also like, wait a minute. Yeah. This is also why one of his early movies, Mondo Trasho, uh, will never get an official release because he said it will cost him over a million dollars just to pay for all the music licensing in it. Because essentially yeah, yeah. that movie is basically, I believe, it's just nonstop like a music track underneath with like some overdubbing. Uh huh. Yeah, because eh, recording audio was kind of tricky back in the day. At one point, I tried to make a movie, I think it was called uh, Dorothy Stoner of Kansas, and they were trying to, like, film it while recording on, like, a little tape deck at the same time and sync it all up. That didn't work. They shot that movie for about a half hour and then gave up. So th- that's literally half hour with the first, where's the footage, and they toss the whole thing. Yeah, they are just like, well, this syncing up isn't working. Let's, uh, let's forget this. John doesn't even really remember what the movie is about. Something about Dorothy probably being stoned. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like it was like oh yeah it's called Dorothy Getting Stone meanwhile it was about like you know it was a remake of or a, the original incarnation of Philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> talking to the Tin Man Tin Man's I have AIDS <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> should have wrapped your funnel better baby <laughs> like oh <laughs> this turned dark <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh next movie from John Waters is going to be Eat Your Makeup and it's going to be his first film on 16 millimeter film this is a story about a nanny who kidnaps young girls and forces them to model themselves in front of her boyfriend and his friends until they die. Bum, bum, bum. Wait, d- I'm assuming there's other violence than just this, just on the modeling. Like, I, I can't get off the catwalk. <laughs> uh, I think it's just they go until they're exhausted. They also force them to eat makeup. I wasn't able to find a copy of this movie to watch. Uh, so That would do it. But, but yeah, the description was basically just forces them to model until they die. I'm assuming pass out from exhaustion. I guess. Well, I mean, if they're if they're captured and the only thing they have to eat is makeup, then yeah, eventually yeah, it would, yeah. you know, yeah, they would die, I guess. This scene actually got a little bit of press because there's a scene where uh, Divine plays Jackie O and recreates the Kennedy assassination while in full drag. 
Oh, that's some awesome. Pe- yeah, some people found this a little tasteless because the actual assassination only happened a few years prior. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah I, I, it was only a couple I years after. The, yeah, and people were like, Ugh. fun side story from this movie. Uh, the uh, dress that Divine was wearing, the Jackie O dress, was like completely covered in flake, fake blood, and uh, he stuffed it stuffed it into his parents' trunk of their car. And one day, the pa- he kind of forgot about, it and his mom opened up the trunk and was like, "What? What's this bloody dress in the back of the?" Uh, car and divine got really frightened it was all stoned it was like uh uh i'm jackie kennedy mom and then just ran off <laughs> the parents were like huh all right then and they just dropped it after that <laughs> they didn't yeah. know at this point that uh divine was into drag oh that's funny well he yeah. would be it would be divine if that wasn't if it was i mean i don't know what divine's real name is uh, sure you do. glenn harris milstead glenn, okay. i was actually trying to say glenn a minute ago but i could not think of the name is is was he an assassin? Because there's three words, uh, three names. Uh, oh, yeah, serial killer. Hmm, good question. Yeah, I don't know why I put down third n- middle name. Oh, do you know why they do that, the middle name for serial killers? Uh, to make them stand out? Uh, kind of. It makes it harder to confuse it with uh, people who have the normal name. Because, I mean, there's probably like 5,000 Ted Bundys out there, but, if you know. You yeah, know fair. Name. Yeah, well, well, John Wayne Ted Gacy. B- Actually, I just said that, and I'm like, wait, man, there's no middle name for Ted Bundy. <laughs> like, like, wait, what, what is Ted Bundy's real life? <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, John Wayne Gacy would be a much better uh, example yeah. of this. Apparently, there's not that many Ted Bundys out there. Well, not anymore. <laughs> if, you're, yeah. if your last name's Bundy, like, the last thing you would name your kid is Ted. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm taking the name back. Like, no. You're, yeah, we you're got, oh, man, we all got two <laughs> things we can name our kid. Ted or Al. Hmm. Right. <laughs> Let's flip a coin. Yeah. It also kind of popped in my head watching some of this early footage of John Waters and kind of his looks and the way he'd be in his attitude. He kind of gives me off a uh, Jonan Vasquez vibe, you know, that too cool for school, I'm a outside hipster kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you kind of get that. Yeah, if you actually look in the chat, I actually popped up a picture of him as he's young under the general thing, I think. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, that's I'm not saying I met John, uh, John Vasquez a lot, but I met him twice at a convention. And yeah, you kind of get the same vibe off the two. I guess you should say Jonan Vasquez has a John Waters vibe. Since one is very much older than the other. Is it the black and white one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I see it, yep. Yeah. We'll get into what, what the is... other two pictures are in a moment. I was about to say, what the hell is going <laughs> on with the other pictures? <laughs> we will get to that in just a moment. <laughs> uh, okay, and after this uh, mo- uh, movie came John Waters' first full-length film, Mondo Trasho, the one we were just talking about with too much music in it for them to ever release it. Uh, this plot is basically a lady known as bombshell rides around with uh divine in baltimore and experiences weird stuff like foot fetishes and the mother mary blessing people and again this doesn't have a lot of dialogue it's mainly just music cues and like overcut dialogue on top of it you know it's not not good from what i saw there's only a few clips out there i saw the one where uh divine's praying to the mother mary it's basically a scene of divine like rolling around the floor playing to praying to somebody dressed as mother mary saying oh god oh god Oh God, oh God, oh God, Mother Mary, oh God, oh God, save me, save me, oh God, oh God. And that goes on for like three or four minutes. Insane, batch of things like Mother Mary blessing people. What? No. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you actually see the scene, it's kind of weird. Oh, I'm, I mean, yeah. hell, your description of it sounds weird. Y- yeah. It's kind of one of those things, too. I'm guessing if you went to Catholic school at the time, you probably would find it even more funny because you know, there's some kind of out there Catholics at times who go a little overboard with their worship of Mary. Yeah, think. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's kind of what that scene well, was about with uh, John I wasn't Waters raised too. Catholic, you know. I, 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 you know, did the whole art, you know, conversion thing, the Catholicism. So, like, I saw a little bit of that. I mean, I saw plenty of that when I was Baptist. Now that I'm atheist, this is like, <laughs> it's all ridiculous. But yeah. this movie was also Mondo Trasho, that is. Uh, John Waters is not a huge fan of it. He wishes he made it into a short film instead of a full length one. So, there's way too much filler. But this movie was also notable of it got most of the crew arrested, including John Waters, for a conspiracy to commit indecent exposure. What? There's this, yeah, there's this one scene where Divine is driving around in like a 65 convertible Cadillac, and she pulls over, picks up a nude hitchhiker. And was there setting up for that scene, neighbors saw that and called the police thinking it was going to be like a prostitution thing was going on outside of their house. So as they're starting to shoot the scene, Divine pulls up to go pick up the nude hitchhiker. The cops come whipping in. Hop out of the cars and start yelling at everybody. Everybody got arrested except for Divine, who saw everything happen in the rearview mirror and just floored it and just got the hell out of town. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> correct. <laughs> that, that was correct, too. And John Waters was like, I'm surprised they didn't catch her because it's a drag queen that looks like Divine driving a convertible Cadillac. It seems like that wouldn't have been hard to find. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mean, but that giant thing with neon lights on it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this was also the movie where the Dreamlanders dubbed a divine the hog princess. Because there's one scene that I guess they were driving around and they noticed a farmhouse off to the side of the road. And next to this farmhouse was a pig pen, a big, muddy, shit filled pig pen. And they decided, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have Divine crawl around in a big pile of pig shit for one of our scenes? So they decided to do that. And they pulled over, not, nope, the, just pulled over, pulled out a camera, said, Divine, get in that mud and start rolling around. And uh, as Divine was rolling around in the mud, having a good old time, all of a sudden, two of the pigs in the pen just started just going at it with each other, just humping madly. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody looked at this side and goes, hmm, Divine must make pigs horny. Therefore, she can be called the Hog Princess. The yeah, nickname really didn't stick past that scene, but, you know, they thought that was funny. Even better, though, was the fact that uh, John Waters was discussing the fact that he wonders what the family inside that house was thinking watching that go on. Because he said there was cars there, there was lights on, and the house was probably like 30 feet away, and there's no way they didn't see a bunch of hippies and a drag queen playing around in their pig pen. Like, if they was there just like, no, Martha, just let them bond themselves out. There are weird yeah. hippies that way. Just let them do that <laughs> thing. Hippies are back. <laughs> yeah. He, he's very glad they didn't call the cops, too. Yeah, well, yeah. Maybe they're into that kind of stuff. Who knows? But that was something they did a lot in their movies. They never asked for permission. They're like, hey, we're just going to show up, trespass, do our thing, and hope we get out before the cops show up. Also, weird random side fact about John I learned that he talks about a lot. His favorite drug? Poppers. You know, those little inhalants that you can get? Okay, those are his favorite things. He likes to do them on roller coasters and while doing stuff like grocery shopping. Poppers? Yeah, poppers. They're a vasodilator. Apparently, you take a big old inhale and they uh, give you a huge head rush. Oh, there you go. Go. Yeah, you can buy them in like sex shops and online. Which, yeah, interesting. Also, he uh, likes weed and LSD. But poppers, he says that's his go-to drug, even though he hasn't done them since like the 80s. Also, as far as uh, John Rars' substances, his only regret in life? Smoking. He says at one point in life, he was smoking up to four packs a day. And uh, the thing that actually got him to quit is kind of a weird story. It was after a movie premiere, and he ran out of cigarettes, and he was Jones and real bad for smoke like no other. So he went up to a homeless person and asked him if he could have a drag off their cigarette. And the homeless person, as they had the cigarette, gave him a big old wing. was like, yo, want to sip off of my soda, too, there, sweetheart? And he said he felt so awkward, so low at the moment, asking to take a drag off a homeless person's cigarette, he decided to quit at that point. And now he actually, every day, he wrote down on a little card how many days he's been quit and carries that around in his pocket. And if he could also send one met note, note back to his young self, it would be, don't smoke, but do everything else the same. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, four packs a day. That's a lot. And I actually saw an interview where he's showing off uh, his apartment. And yeah, like every time he walked by an ashtray, he'd immediately reach over and grab out a cigarette and just start just taking big old drags off of it. That dude was a smoker. Yeah, sounds like. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know I struggled for a little bit. And then, um, I don't know, my body started rejecting it, so... Yeah, and you got out, got out when you're still young and good. Yep. 1970 brought us a couple of movies of his. First, the Diane Linkletter story, based off of the suicide of Art Linkletter's daughter. Uh, the morning papers basically had a uh, story about Diane Linkletter's suicide, and John and the crew had a, some new camera equipment to test out, and they're like, hey, let's see if we can make a little skit about this. So they went out, improv and riffed for a little bit, and didn't really come up with a movie, but just uh, kind of a dumb little short film testing out their new equipment called... And then uh, the second movie, Multiple Maniacs, uh, was a his quote-unquote first full-length talkie film, meaning actual real dialogue instead of uh, layered over, as in it's actually them talking on screen, not just, you know, uh, voice. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. So was it, there's no talking as prior films? There was talking, but it wasn't the actual actors talking on screen and then being recorded. It was them, like, pantomiming and doing, like, you know... Uh, Basically miming all the stuff. Well, you could tell it's very obvious something they recorded days after the fact being piped in. I gotcha. I yeah. gotcha. I, I know what you mean. I, I've seen Mr. Sassy a thousand. I know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were talking in the films, but it wasn't actually them talking in time, memorizing lines and recording it. Like the Divine Mother Mary thing is basically just her being like, ooh, ooh making like kind of like, ooh, ah faces while the dialogue's going on. If that makes more sense. Or it maybe I just confuse you even more. Nope. I got it. Okay. Multiple Maniacs is about a freak show that's run by Divine. It's free to attend, but at the end, she robs you. Then Divine gets bored with this concept and moves on to killing people at the end of the uh, freak show. 
And that's kind of just it. She just accelerates to from uh, robbing people to killing people. This movie also does have some weird stuff, including the uh, in, some anal rosary action and some cannibalization. Uh, the infant of Prague shows up for some reason, too. And also, one scene where I can probably only use this term legitimately once in my life. It features Rape Lobster! Bow, now, 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 now. Yep, there's a scene where uh, a surprisingly well-made-for-its-budget lobster has its way with Divine. Yes. Well, there you go. Great. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and it should be noted, John came up with this idea while on LSD. He was hanging out at the beach, and over near him was a billboard, and it was one of those billboards that's like, Visit Baltimore! And it had like a big cartoon lobster on there, like having a cookout or something. And as he was high on acid, he saw that and was like, Huh, lobster rape. I should put that in a movie. Yeah. LSD. <laughs> and so and so it was done. And so it was done. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Everything about these movies is interesting. Uh, uh, that movie actually ends with Divine trying to kill everyone in Baltimore before being gunned down by the National Guard to the tune of America the Beautiful. So Divine in the in the lobster? Uh no, not the lobster. The lobster had its way with Divine. And then after that, Divine trip went around trying to kill everybody in Baltimore. Probably post yeah. lobster trauma. <laughs> yeah, that lobster really did a number. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Uh, and while they're making this movie, um, Mondo Trasho was actually making his round and getting a lot and a lot more popular. The movie we were just talking about with all the stolen film tracks and uh, not that much uh, actual talking in it. But and eventually, this movie made its way into the hands of a dude named Bob Shea. And Bob Shea was starting up a new company that you might know called New Line Cinema. You know that I've name? Never heard of it. New Line Cinema. They have made such movies as the Lord of the Rings movies and a million others. I know you're lying to me. I am lying to you. <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, back then, however, their main income was just distributing copies of Reefer Madness to college campuses. That was basically all they did. Maybe put out the occasional tiny little film that didn't do anything. Well, he got uh, Bob Shea got a copy of Mondo Trash Show, and he was like, "Hey." I kind of like the cut of your jib, John. You go out and you make something that's a more higher budget with more money and a little bit better, and I'll actually uh, distribute it for you. We can get something going together. So John went to his parents and said, hey, I need $12,000 to make one of the most perverse movies you will ever see. And they said, okay. And with $12,000, thus 1972's Pink Flamingos, probably John Waters' most memorable film. Possibly one of the most memorable films of all time, too. Never seen it. If I watched it, uh, it's this is one of those things. If I saw it when I was really young, I probably would have been disgusted by it. But seeing it as an adult, uh, uh, I was infinitely amused by how weird and just out there deviant it was. This what is you, the movie where Divine, about? huh? Oh, this is the movie where Divine is the filthiest person in the world, a title which she earned just by being herself. And apparently, in this form of the world, John Waters is spinning, the filthiest person in the world is an actual title that you can win, and it's something that shows up on magazines of, like, Deviant Monthly and this and stuff. She does this stuff by living her life and doing things like, to start it out, there's a scene where she goes into a meat mart, she buys a steak, and to carry the steak home, she literally just, like, takes and just jams it up her dress and holds it between her legs to take it home and feed it to her family. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, she does a lot of stealing and making fun of people and shooting people. And, I don't know, just a lot of weird deviant things, and including one thing at the end that gets really odd. We'll talk about. Is in a there moment. a plot? Yeah, actually, she's got the title of the most filthy person in the world. However, her title is soon challenged by a degenerate couple who want to become the uh, nastiest, filthiest people in the world and take over her role. But they do it by uh, their. Ba- she does it, the moral of the story is basically divine. Does it by natural ways by being herself, whereas the quote unquote bad guys who are trying to steal the title do it by you know being tryhards who aren't really that nasty, but they just want to pretend to be. However, the degenerate couple do do things like kidnap women and have them impregnated by a, their manservant, and then they sell the babies to lesbian couples for money. Then they use those profits from that to uh, finance heroin dealers in elementary schools. In fact, that you seems, can get a... Huh? That seems overly complicated. Uh, it it kind of does, yeah. Uh, yeah, it seems like you could cut out one of those things. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we also don't be like really nasty as being like a shitty, pure, shitty person. Yeah, they even show the uh, part where they kidnap uh, women and throw them into a pit with their manservant. And the way he impregnates him is he actually jacks off into his hand and then takes a syringe and fills that up with the cum and then just jams that uh, like little injector into the women. Uh, they basically just have this pit of women that they keep knocking up and stealing their babies and selling them. Fun. Yeah, yeah, and this is stuff that they actually do show. 
Uh, there's another scene too where, okay, so the degenerate couple they hire some chick to go investigate Divine's family and try to get dirt on her. They're like, we want you to go date her son and find out everything you can from her son. And she's like, well, you're gonna have to pay me good money because their son has some very, very deviant sexual things that I'm gonna have to take a uh, part in. You're like, all right, here's your money. Go do what you got to do. The very next scene, she's with their son, her divine son. And they're having sex, full naked sex, with one alive chicken and a dead chicken in between them. Uh, basically, they went out and they got a dead chicken for them to have sex with. What's like its, it's actual head is cut off. You can see this one chicken in between them with its head missing. And then to the side of them, like the dude's holding on to a live chicken who looks very confused with what's going on. Occasionally, that poor chicken like looks at the camera being like, record scratch? You'll never guess how I got here. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean... <sighs> Literally, they are having a sex scene with a dead chicken in between them and, like, holding an actual chicken. And she's like, oh, yes, yes, do me, do me. He's like, I love chickens and eggs. I love chickens and eggs. Uh, there's kind of an egg theme with that family, too. Because uh, I kind of like this one scene because it brings up some other fun stories uh, involving John Waters' day-to-day -day activities. Uh, Divine's mom is played by this uh, dreamlander named Edith Massey. And if you look back at those pictures I showed you, you see the old lady in the crib? Or older lady yes. in the crib? Yep. yep. That is played, that is Edith Massey. And first of all, she basically plays this role where she's basically a giant woman baby and she just hangs out in the crib yelling at Divine, like, Divine, where's the egg man? I want my eggs. I need my eggs. Because there's this egg, a traveling egg salesman who comes by who sells all grades and all types of eggs. And he's romancing this big elderly baby lady. Spoiler alert, eventually they do get married at the end. It's kind of sweet. But, uh, I object. But, yeah, <laughs> it was not sweet. <laughs> uh, it, 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 as far as this movie goes, it was sweet. Trust me. But because she plays this uh, role of kind of like a simpleton, there's some rumors early on of them of her being mentally disabled and the crew taking advantage of her because they're like, oh, obviously they have to keep her in a pen to keep her from escaping, kind of stuff. That kind of dumb thing. Yeah. Which John Rogers responded. He's like, do you think she could have remembered her lines if she was that disabled? Uh, Oh, yeah. One thing about this movie, too, is there are some, like, decently long lines of dialogue for people to remember in this. I mean, we're talking, like, several minutes of back-and-forth dialogue. Apparently, too, John Waters is kind of an ass during recording this, so, like, if they even flubbed up a syllable, he would, like, get all pissed off and start screaming and make them redo everything. Yeah, that's shitty. Yeah, kind of shitty. But also, Edith Massey, another story, she was actually, because of her looks and the roles she played, she was one of the uh, favorites of all the fans. She, one fun story John Waters liked to tell about her is uh, she ran a thrift store in Baltimore. And it was a thrift store that went on, solely on donations. And during the summer months, not a lot of people would be donating, giving her stuff. So she wouldn't have a whole lot of things to sell. So in her clever way, she would start pulling stuff out of the trash, like bottle caps and uh, paper clips that were bent up and other various things that she was just throwing away. She would gift wrap each of these things and put them in a big bin and just be like, mystery surprise pack, 25 cents. And all the neighborhood kids would be like, ooh, what's that? You might get a prize, kids. And the kids would just open them up, and it would always be garbage every time. And when they would be confused or mad, she would just look at them and be like, oh, sweetheart, you can't be lucky every time. So that's how she <laughs> – yeah, right. Every one of them was junk, though. Uh, Actually, yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess it reminds me, there's a um, – like a – was an indoor flea market, like a Peddler's Mall, like here near in town. Mm -hmm. and they have this room there you go in there everyone has to think there is this room full of boxes like random boxes all taped up and they're like okay you you know, was it like 25 or 50 dollars for a box about you don't know what's in there i'm like I'm yeah not, no <laughs> no <laughs> right that. yay they're like it's worth at least 50 dollars, and you get like five five dollar t-shirts they're like well those are worth like 20 bucks each it's like yeah no, no. <laughs> yeah no i stay away from those kind of things uh, there's a story we had here that had like returned Amazon boxes that were randomly packaged up or something like that. It was like random Amazon boxes, twenty five dollars. Who knows what you'll get? I do nothing. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Oh yeah. Also, another thing about Edith Massey. Two other facts John Waters brought up. Apparently, she was one of the sweetest people in the world, other than when she drank. She only drank a couple of times, but apparently, a mean drunk. And also, when you drove around with her, she had this thing that drove John Waters crazy, where she would literally just list off everything she saw. She'd be in passion. She'd be like, dog, car, tree, house, car, tree, fire hydrant, sidewalk. He said that woman had, like, no internalization. I want to kill you over and over. Yeah. Uh, for uh, Pink Flamingos, actually, John Waters hired Teamsters. It was, like, one of the first movies that they actually hired some of the crew for. 
in order to save money, they would actually bribe these teamsters that on their way from the job, the studio, they would actually quote unquote borrow equipment temporarily and loan it to John Waters so that they could have some nicer equipment than what they had. I mean, they would give it back and everything, but yeah, they weren't really supposed to be renting it out like that. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one of the teamsters too, uh, they were kind of, all the teamsters were sort of weirded out by what was going on, but you know, they're teamsters, whatever union they'll deal with it. But one of the teamsters, John said, brought out his wife to the shooting one day. The wife walked up into the set and saw Edith Massey in the corner in the little uh, dressed in her underwear in the crib and was like, hi, nice lady. And the wife turned around and looked at her husband like, we're not staying here. We're leaving. And she forced him to leave and they never saw them again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Something's wrong here. They have an adult woman and a baby playpen over there. I mean, it's funny, but also what a bitch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know, right. Could have hung around, you know, talked to them and. Yeah, associated with him a little bit and see what was up. Uh, the end of this movie involves one of the most shocking scenes ever. And this is the scene that John Waters said got him as close as he ever would to those old horror movies where people were freaking out. This is the infamous dog do eating scene where Divine follows around a dog for a while and eats dog poo diligently. Actually, I got that written down better. Where Divine devours dog do diligently. Ooh, alliteration. Good for me. Like for real or like chocolate? 100% for real, like fresh, uh, fresh uh, warm out of the dog. Uh, I just Look at picture little... number three. That's I see. Actually... I saw. I was hoping that was chocolate. but ew. Nope. It is 100% poo. Here's uh, the thing. Yeah. I, I, uh, that's, my, that's my button. I'm if, yeah. <laughs> I, wa- I watched the footage. Trust me. Divine did not enjoy eating that either. It, was, not all I of it made it in the mouth. Like probably. Ba- okay. Um, why would the why? Like what? I, w- I will tell you about that. One, well, John's not a monster, first of all. He asked Divine if that was okay. He's like, Divine, do you mind doing this? Divine's answer was basically a staunch, if it's in the script, I'll do it, because that's how movies are made. John was like, well, that's dedication right there. Uh, the reason John wanted to do it, well, there's actually to- two reasons on this. One, he wanted like he wanted a shocking scene, something that people would talk about, something that would get people to be like, you got to see this in the movie. You got, it's at the end, but you got to wait through the whole thing, but you have to see this. It's something you've never seen before, which is true. The other reason was, and this is actually a slightly more interesting reason, because they were part of the underground film movement. One thing the underground film movement was big on at the time was to push the envelope as far as they could while still staying legal. Hence that movie we talked about earlier where it would show like STD things and, uh, you know, birth to get away with showing full vag on screen yeah you know because it was educational that way it was legal well going through the legal books john realized there is no law against eating poo on camera so he said hey we can push the envelope and see what how the people react to the legal act of eating feces on t on the screen so in it went because that was their contribution to underground movie making this is what we found that was legal we can do on tv and we're going to put it in or on the movie set and uh Apparently, this accomplished everything John Waters wanted, and maybe a little bit more. Got shocked people, got them talking about the movie, and also got a law made about uh, eating poo on TV on uh, in a movie. <laughs> Good. See, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing John talks about, and this might have to do with the fact it was a drag queen doing it. You can't allow to. You're not allowed to eat poo in a movie in a sexual way. You can still eat it in like a humorous or a uh, educational way, I guess educational this is how you eat shit oh yeah God. i guess so but yeah apparently the actual law the way it was written up or at least was back then was like in a sexual way you can't eat and i'm guessing this has to do with the fact people were weirded out by the fact it was a drag queen eating it and it was one of those oh well obviously it's a sex thing if a drag queen's doing it which is a part of that that's a problem i mean like it's just it doesn't matter who's eating it in what way it's like it's someone eating poop like, yeah it is it's gross i watched the scene it's not fun to watch uh, yeah, no, I, I'll yeah. never watch it. This, I see yeah. the, the the pictures enough for me. My, my imagination has done enough. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, the next day, Divine did have some worries, so uh, he called the hospital, claiming his son ate dog poop and what they should do. Uh, the uh, hospital was like, "Well, you know, rinse out some peroxide or whatnot. Keep an eye on the kid." Uh, how old did you say your son was? Divine panicked. It was like uh, twenty four, which was his age. The hospital was like, um, y- yeah, keep an eye on your 24-year-old poo-eating son. Get back to us. <laughs> 24. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's a thing like, you could have said any age. You know, yeah, yeah, right. Just panic. Same thing as panicking and be like, I'm Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> and uh, even though this was not sexual in any way for uh, Divine or John Waters, sometimes after this movie came out, they would get people coming up and being like, dude. That is the hottest thing I've ever seen in my life. You have no idea how turned on I was by that. 
See, that's Which, the test. Someone comes up and says that, you're like, and eh, you failed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John and Vine naturally are always nice people. Like, oh, well, we're glad we could, you know, excite you in that way. But deep down inside, they're like, ew, I don't want to be around this person anymore. Ew, yeah. ew, ew. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they're right. like, Good they right. want to turn around and walk away. But, you know, they were kind of like, eh, well, well, we'll humor them. Um, oh, yeah. Side note. Someone has optioned Pink Flamingos as an opera, but it never went anywhere. Good. Can you imagine singing, uh, <laughs> singing an operatic about uh, eating dog poop. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or uh, inseminating women with a injector. Uh, another thing about Pink Flamingo, it got a 25th anniversary edition, and when it was released in theaters, it was the number two movie be- that year behind Jerry Maguire and ahead of The Rock. That's actually pretty impressive. Head of The Rock. Yeah, the movie The Rock with Sean oh, Connery. You and, said, yeah, not not oh, the actor The Rock. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I heard the movie title was Head of The Rock. I'm like, oh, what? No, sorry. Yeah, Head of The Rock. <laughs> this is it's a movie about uh, Mount Rushmore. Right. <laughs> That was that's what confused me. Like Head of the Rock. What movie is that? Yeah, <laughs> like I've never heard of that movie. There's the Rock, the movie, and the Rock, the actor. Uh, uh, oh, another fun thing about this uh, movie. Uh, John Waters talked about he went to see this in Japan once. And Japan, you know, their weird censorship thing. One of their censorships is no pubic hair on screen, none whatsoever. So when he was watching that, John said that whenever there's pubic hair on screen, apparently this little like censorship ball like floats from the off screen. Just shoots right down to cover up any pubic hair. Yeah. And he said that this actually makes movies feel way more perverse because this little ball literally drags your eyes straight to wherever the worst part is of the scene. <laughs> yeah. He's like, honestly, I wouldn't even notice some of this stuff except this giant floating censorship ball goes right to somebody's crotch. And you're like, oh. And yeah, I can kind of see that. Where it's like, what's that ball doing? Oh, Lord. Yeah, their censorship is so weird. Yeah, yeah, like, he, yeah. He was literally like, "You can show a snuff film over there as long as there's no pubic hair in it." Yeah, like even yeah. in their uh, even their their cartoon stuff, it's like, "Oh, yeah. okay, so let's make sure we cover her bits." Meanwhile, she's being raped by a nine, nine yeah, yeah, dog. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, John says they have the weirdest censorship over there, and he absolutely loves it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it it's so, so nonsensical and weird. It it does it makes no sense. Y- yep. Okay, one last thing about uh, Pink Flamingos, real quick. A copy of this movie is actually in the Museum of Modern Art, and it is also part of the Library of Congress's National Film Registry in a list of movies deemed culturally or aesthetically important to American culture. It made the list in 2021, and John was quite surprised about this. I mean, do, don't they try to save most stuff? Uh, there's actually only like 300 movies, I think, in the Library of Congress. Uh, huh. Yeah, actually, I thought the National Film Registry was like all movies, but I don't know, hold on. Well, I mean, it, it still would make sense. Like, as, as weird as it, as it is, it's still like, you know, um, a movie of note. You know, it's... Yep. It changed. It actually did change a lot of things. Uh, oh, 850 films are what's in the uh, mus- uh, film registry. Cool. I mean, that's way more than like... You're like 10. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like 10 movies in there. What of them took me up? I mean, 850. That's probably almost every movie ever made, I would guess. There can't no, be God, that many no. more than no. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. For a split second, it's like, he's being serious. And it took me a second, like, oh, no, he's not. <laughs> The 800 total. I, I heard that Tony approach is like, what? You idiot. <laughs> There's probably 850 movies released in the last like three years of worldwide. <laughs> Go all stimpy. Was it red? Whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, wait a minute. He's being facetious. Whoops. <laughs> Another random John Waters story that I actually just heard this morning watching an interview. 1975, there is a movie called Snuff that came out, which was one of those fake snuff movies. And the tagline was, shot in South America, where human life means nothing. Kind of a problematic subtitle nowadays, I guess. But right. after that movie came out, John Waters was at home, and all of a sudden he got a call from Roger Ebert. Roger Ebert was like, John, I need you to get me into one of these snuff films so I can see how it's made. And John was like, I don't think those things actually exist, Roger. He's like, yes, yes, they do. I know they exist, and you ha- you're my ticket to go see one. And John was just like, No. <laughs> So yeah, it's kind of a random thing right there. That's random. Another yeah. random thing. Like we, for some reason, that's actually kind of funny. Uh, Roger Ebert came up a conversation yesterday, at my uh, father-in-law's birthday party, and I looked him up. I forgot. Like I had forgotten. He had jaws removed. He looks so weird. He but, does. I mean, I, mean, I, I get it. Like so was jaws removed. Of course, it would look weird. No shit. But yeah, like, yeah. He looked most like people he have per- a whole jaw. He was. He looked like he was just perma smiling, mm. and it was just. It was unsettling, you know, and yeah. I felt bad. I feel bad for the guy, you know. Um, he kind of looked like a I, Cenobite or something like that after yeah. all the surgery. He's just like, you see him I mean, in the shadow and corner and you're, ah. I mean, I, he did piss me off with the whole, like, video games art art thing type thing. But it's yeah. like, 
you know, but I mean, that's his, he's expressing his personal opinion fine. But you can express your opinion even if it's wrong, like that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's whatever, but it's, yeah, it still irritated me. Yeah, yeah, I was irritated by him saying that too, but that's just him being old. He's probably all bitter because he never got to see a snuff film. Yeah, I mean, a, really, a snuff film? That's, that's your, that's your thing. Like, I need, I, I, yeah. I must watch someone die. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, he, maybe he was just really high that day or something. He's like, I know, I'll just call John Waters. Yeah, maybe the part of the conversation we didn't hear is after John Waters said, no, Roger Ebert's like, so what you wearing? Right. Uh, and that's going to be it for our first episode on John Waters. We made Nate gag this episode. That was fun. Tune in next week when we discuss if John Waters is a necrophile, Dorf Wharf on golf, who John Waters planned on kidnapping, what's in the Pulp Fiction suitcase, and finally, what sex act John Waters invented. Come on back next week for that and more with part two of our John Waters episode. This is where the ending jingle goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes.